Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the bridge. Good morning. It's good to see you guys. We're going to do just kind of a short call to worship today, and uh, then we'll jump into, uh, you know, singing. And uh, I think just even before I read this scripture, I um, just want to remind you all that God knew before the foundation of the world that you would be where you are right now. And if you look at your life, it may be kind of a mix of somewhat together, somewhat falling apart, and everything in between. But God's here. His presence is with you. He, because of what Jesus has done, he's for you. And he loves you. And this welcome and this call to worship is in some ways from, from me and, and from some ways from all of us here, but most importantly, the welcome is from him. He welcomes you into his presence where he promises when you go close to him, you will find grace and get help in your time of need. So Psalm 145, three and four says this, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Had several conversations with people before church started today. And uh, my favorite was with Rowan Turner. Um, he came into my office and wanted to know what everything was in the office and he was searching and looking and saw one door and then another door and saw this little sand timer that I have and played with that and informed me that he's in kindergarten this year. Guys, what we're doing as we worship the Lord models and shows from one generation to another the love of God and the gift of family. So guys, you may not feel it today. Ask God to give you the feeling of joy and appreciation and gratitude to worship him because how we worship affects generation after generation after generation. Great is the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. I invite you to stand with sin and worship.
Give a shout of praise. Thank you all so much for um, singing. Um, your faith is encouraging me this morning. I, uh, I had a late night last night, and then uh, the Lord woke me up even, even earlier than that. And um, I was just thinking about King David and uh, dancing in an undignified way before the Lord. And uh, my kids started school this week, which is a whole whole thing. And uh, luckily, Mrs. Davis is my daughter's preschool teacher, which is awesome. Yeah. And uh, my kids, my kids will do this thing. We've got Google Homes, you know, our little smart devices all around the, the house, and they'll say, "Hey Google," and they'll pick some song, and they're just parading and dancing around the house, just with complete joy and. It's like, you know, 90s country and hip hop and everything in, in between. And, um, you know, I think sometimes as adults or, you know, more mature in our faith, we, we, kind of, um, we kind of have gotten in a rhythm of either coming to church or our Bible study or um, even just the way that we, we pray. I don't think there's anything wrong with discipline and constantly showing up to the table, but um, man, what would it look like uh, if I could just get outside of myself and actually see him and would I dance in an undignified way? I'm not saying we gotta parade around like fools this morning and, and uh, you know, act, uh, act all weird, but man, when's the last time, and I don't wanna make anyone feel uncomfortable here if you don't want to, but when's the last time you just extended your hand to God like this and just said, Lord, I'm here, I'm ready to see you, I'm ready to experience you? Um, as worship leaders, you know, that's kind of like a thing we do, but um, even just that motion of being open uh, to the goodness of the Lord and what he has for us here today is so powerful. Um, so I pray that you would find that joy this morning, that you would um, dance or sing or express in an undignified way this morning because he's good and he's not that hard to find. He's right around us all the time.
Watch over me. You're always present. You're always with me for all of my life. Your favor has followed my covering. I have never walked alone. I've never been. You're my inheritance. You are my strength and shield, and I have confidence that you've gone before me. You're my deliverer, and I know I've never. Never been abandoned. You're my inheritance. You are my strength and shield, and I have confidence that you go before me. You're my deliverer, and I know I've never. Every hour, every minute, you have always been there. You are faithful and you always will be. Yes. In every trial, in every failure, you are loyal to me. You are faithful and you always will be. Yes. In every hour, Every minute you have always been there. You are faithful and you always will be. Yes. In every trial and every failure, you are loyal to me. You are faithful and you always will be. Yes. You are faithful and you always will be as I've never walked alone Thank you, uh, thank you, Jesus, for your presence here.
this morning and always, God. And when I'm lost and when we're wandering and life gets really cloudy, um, you're never hard to find. Need we only look to the cross, to the sacrifice, and know that we are chosen sons and daughters of the High King, the one who is and will always be. And so God, uh, this morning, um, break us of our routine, break us of any monotony that we have in our heart, break us of just the mundane motions that we walk through because you're a God that is present and relational and wants to know your, your children more and we, we want to know more about you. And so God, I pray that there is um, a fire in our hearts this morning, a stirring in our spirit, a stirring in our soul uh, that knows that it, it can only be satisfied by you, that you're the only thing um, that is good in us and you're the only thing that's good in this world. And so Father, I, um, I just speak over darkness this morning. I speak over anxiety, over worry, over busyness, over uh, health this morning. Um, that you're good and you're faithful and true and your hand is in all things even when we don't see it. So we love you, Lord. Um, keep pouring out your spirit this morning. It's in your name I pray, amen. At this time, we'd like to dismiss dismiss kids birth through fifth grade to go back to Sunday school. And y'all be good to your teachers now, okay? Yes, 
all your promises are yes and amen. This is good news here. That I will rest in your promises, my confidence. Your faithfulness that I can rest in your promises, my confidence. Yes, you are faithful. Yes, I will rest in your promises, my confidence. Is your faithfulness? Yes, I will. your faithfulness faithful you are faithful forever you will be faithful you are you saw your promises are yes and amen that all your promises are yes and amen. Faithful you are. Give a shout of praise in there. Amen. You may be seated. So we're in the book of Galatians, and what we just sang is what Paul wants to drive home to the people that he loves and cares about as he writes this letter. He wants them to know that their relationship with God is not based upon their performance. It's based upon the performance of the perfect one, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And because Jesus was perfect in all things, and then he died in our place to forgive us and to wash our sins away, we can trust Jesus' promise, which says, all who the Father gives to me will come to me, and I will be with them, and I will never leave or forsake them. And... Uh, but we have a variety of different relational interactions with people. Uh, there is in life a husband-wife relationship, a parent-child relationship, a boss-employee relationship, a teacher-student relationship, a neighbor relationship, um, a tax person relationship. I'm trying to think of one that nobody really likes that much. Um, <laughs> We have a variety of different relationships with people. And Paul is going to up the ante here in this passage of scripture at the beginning of Galatians 4. And it's hit me this week as I've spent some time in this text, but also spent some time just getting in my head to try to wrap around the fact that I don't believe that believers, and I'm going to put myself in this category, believers in Jesus Christ really live day to day like we are sons and daughters of God. 
I think that it has been a problem for us ever since day one in the garden when Adam and Eve ate the fruit that they weren't supposed to eat from. They run and they hide. And in their shame and guilt, which was correct, they were disobedient from God, they lost connection with him. And there is something inside every human being that allows us to realize we've lost connection with our creator God, but then we act as though we can somehow do something to earn back good standing and good favor with God. So there was a group of people, we've heard this several weeks now, that came into the church in Galatia and they said, okay, you believe in Jesus, that's good. But if you really want gold stars in your Christian faith, then you also need to do this and this and this and this and this. And if you do those things really, really well, then God will really, really love you and be pleased with you. And uh, that is just simply not the gospel. The gospel says that Jesus has died in your place, risen from the dead, forgiven you, and made you right with him. He connects us to God's indelible grace. Um, But feelings come and go. That's why the one song about uh, you've lost that loving feeling and now it's gone, gone, gone. It can be gone and then it can be there and it can be all over the place and we're wishy-washy and we can be fickle, right? And I I should probably take just a moment to say, um, I feel a little bit of a need to apologize to uh, specifically John, who I called out for being a Chicago Bears fan last week. And for all of the Chicago Cubs fans that are here, the Lord spoke to me this week as the Cardinals had a very dismal week that pride comes before a fall and that I need to quit bragging about being a Cardinal fan and simply pray for my team. Um, at the same time, We get our identity right in a variety of different ways based on things that we do. We talked last week about being clothed with Jesus. And that's how the whole Chicago Cubs, Chicago Bears thing came up that like, I would not wear a Bears or Cubs shirt or jersey. (laughs) Man, here we are again already and the sermon just started. Okay. Um, But... We all do wear things and some things we're proud of wearing and other things we're not proud of wearing. In fact, we may not even admit out loud that we're wearing it, but man, it's all over us. We have, psychiatrists have called it an inner critic that speaks to us often. Some people would describe the inner critic if you're talking about biblical terminology as we have an accuser of the brethren. We have a thief who comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And he will get inside our mind and in our thoughts and our feelings. And he will tell us that we are not who we really are as Christians. And the way to combat that fight and that battle is to basically say, wait, I know I'm not worthy, but there is one who is, his name is Jesus. And he has declared, I am worthy. I am a son or daughter of the king. There is a lot at stake. And you being able by the Holy Spirit, which we're going to talk about today and how the Holy Spirit makes this a reality for us, that when you look at yourself in the mirror, what do you see? Who do you see? Okay, the what you see should be if you're in Christ and you have faith in Jesus and you've asked him to forgive you of your sins, I am a child of the king. I am a beloved son of or daughter. I have been adopted into the family of God 
and no one can ever disown me from that reality. There is nothing, the Bible says, that God, that you can do that will make God love you any less. And there is nothing that you can do that will make God love you any more. Now, some people look at that and go, well, then what if I go and do da 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 then, then you don't have the awareness of the Holy Spirit in your life and heart because the Holy Spirit will actually allow that to get inside your head and you'll go, then I want to love him. Then I want to walk with him. Then I want to obey him. Then I want to live my life according to his plan. So the, the people throughout all the ages have had this war with the law. Okay, the law of God. And anything that is law of God is good. There's law of man, and that's a mixed bag. Some good ideas, some bad ideas. The law of God is perfect and flawless. And the reason why we as human beings have trouble with the law of God is because the law of God shows us where we fall short. It shows us our mistakes. It shows us our sin. And the law of His purpose is to drive us to the one who fulfilled the law. Jesus fulfilled the law and then can connect us to God. So the first three verses of Galatians 4 talk about what we were like under the law. And then the last three verses, 4, 5, and 6, and maybe 7, talk about how the Holy Spirit's at work in us. This is God's word to us today. I mean that the heir... As long as he is a child is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Let's pray. Father, help this become an experiential reality today for us, that if we are in Christ, we are dearly beloved sons and daughters of the King, of you. You're our Father, and you give us the ability to cry out, Abba, Father. Help us to know that love, to feel that love, to trust that love, to walk in that love today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So there are several people in our congregation that would put C.S. Lewis up there in one of their favorite authors. And I think most people's first experience with C.S. Lewis is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I got to read that book when I was in fifth grade before Disney came and turned it into a movie. And uh, because it was required reading in a classroom, I don't think I took it that seriously. It seems as though books that teachers tell me I must read, I don't really get as excited about than books that I actually choose to read myself. It took longer for The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and The Chronicles of Narnia to really grip my heart. But it did. But I want to tell you about the backstory of why C.S. Lewis was prompted to write the Chronicles of Narnia. During World War II, there were uh, people living in London, and London was getting bombed, and people would send their kids out to the countryside that was not getting bombed. And C.S. Lewis had a cottage in the country, and he had four kids come and live with him, and he took them to church every single Sunday morning. And he began to observe their interaction and behavior in Sunday morning during sermons. And he saw them yawn. And he saw their heads kind of go like this. And he saw them like counting the bricks on the wall. And and all of these just signs of absolute complete boredom. 
And initially, C.S. Lewis went, well, these kids need to learn respect for God in the house of God. And then he actually began to listen to what the minister was saying. And he went, oh, my goodness, if I was their age, I'd be bored to tears, too. And then he began to ask, okay, something needs to be done. What do I do in order to make the gospel come alive to kids? God, show me. Show me how you can use me to help the gospel come alive. Had a random dream of a fawn with an umbrella holding parcels that became Mr. Tumnus by a lamppost. It came to him in a dream. And then later he had a dream of a lion named Aslan. And then he put pen to paper and he began to write. Let me talk to you a little bit. If you have not read the book or watched the movie, but the book is better than the movie. Uh, you have a friendly assignment from your pastor and friend, okay? You, you, everyone should read this book, but don't read it just because I told you or you may not really like it, like I told you if a teacher assigns something to me. Read it because C.S. Lewis picked up on something. Because what happens is Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, the four children in this book, actually enter Narnia by way of a wardrobe and are caught up in the story of sin and the curse of Narnia, where it's always winter and never Christmas. And then the redeemer that's going to come, that's going to die in the place and reverse the curse as far as it's been found, right? Joy to the world. It hit me that in a way, Paul, as he's pinning this part of Galatians, is trying to invite his brothers and sisters in Christ to walk into a wardrobe because they have heard the story of Jesus. But the story of Jesus is not just supposed to be heard. It's supposed to be experienced and it's supposed to be lived out in day to day. So what's it mean to live it out? Paul, uh, David said in Psalm 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So as the four children are entering into Narnia, they feel the snow like crumping down as, as they're stepping on it. They have to grab coats because all of a sudden it got colder. And then they actually realize, whoa, wait, we play a part in the redemption of Narnia. That we are two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve. And we are caught up in this story of redemption. So life is not TGIF. And I I do like Fridays. Okay, but if I live my whole week for Friday, I have missed this thing that God is wanting to catch me up in that every moment of every day, every single time I interact with another human being, I have an opportunity to tell them, hey, do you know the one who created you? Do you know that he not only can forgive sin and tolerate you or put up with you, that he actually has chosen to adopt you and wants you at the family table. I think the guy's name was Mark Lawry. He's a old time Christian comedian. I say old time because I think it was more like circa 90s or something like that, which I guess is older now. Um, But he had ADD and ADHD all through growing up and teachers couldn't stand him because they didn't know what to do with him. And uh, he had been told through church that God loves you. But guess what? Church is another time where you're supposed to listen and be quiet and be still. And he just couldn't seem to do that. So he was always getting in trouble in school and always getting in trouble in church. And finally, someone sat down with him and said, hey, don't you know that God loves you? And he said, yeah. 
I know God loves me, but I don't think God likes me. You know, there's, there's a, a difference between those two things. I don't know where my mom found it, but my mom told me one time that you love someone, you like someone because you love someone although. And there's a, there's a commitment of love that should surpass how we feel and how we behave, okay? If, if you care deeply about your bloodline family, you get this. There are moments and times where your bloodline family is like, good thing we're blood, because otherwise I'd cancel you. And it's good to have that assurance of we're family and, and you're not going away. But it is much more uplifting to say, wait, this person likes me because, and then you begin to list those things. And this person who had that meeting with Mark Lowry went on to say, Mark, you are creative and you are energetic and you have passion and you are funny. And as you begin to list all those things, you saw Mark's confidence grow and his assurance pick up. And I don't want to center because everything in this book is God-centered and that's good that everything in this book is God-centered. But it is also important for us not to propose that things are so God-centered that the God who said, I wanna be your father and I love you and I've adopted you, doesn't delight in you as a human being. God delights in you. John, in one of his sermons, one time says this, like this, uh, I think he used an image of the voice and is like, you know, I, I, I choose you. If you've watched that show, like you're, you're chosen by someone. God has chosen you in Christ. He's given you gifts. He's given you abilities and he wants you to use all your gifts and abilities, everything you've got, your time, your talent, your treasure to walk with him and to watch him redeem the world to himself. It's quite an invitation. But I'm concerned, and this is where I almost don't even know all the places this sermon can go from here, that my functional reality and the way that I live day to day, I don't accept that invitation and sometimes I don't even hear that invitation because I have settled for lesser things. So C.S. Lewis, one more time, in one of his most famous essays called The Weight of Glory, and if you've been around our church for very long, this will be familiar to you, but it's worth rereading. C.S. Lewis felt like this is our view of God, or this is what God feels about our view of him. Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. We are far too easily pleased. So I think Paul's invitation as we tap into what sonship and daughtership to the king looks like is Paul's way of saying, don't be far too easily pleased in your walk with God. Um, oftentimes when people first come to faith in Jesus, they're thankful and they should be, but they're thankful that God could forgive all the bad things they've done in their life. And, and, and that's good. But there's another piece of being saved. There's redeemed from your past 
And then there's adopted into a family of God. And uh, both of those are supposed to be present. So um, anyway, I'm going to, verses 4, 1 through 3, just talks about the war of the law and the struggle with that. I'm just going to dive into to verse 4. It said, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. So when we're under the law and we're struggling to obey the law, we're kind of in a holding place. It will feel like a prison. It'll feel like bondage. And then it says in the fullness of time. Another way to say that would be at just the right time. I don't know how you do with, with waiting. Um, I got to go to Chick-fil-A, which is one of my favorite places to eat on Friday night. Actually, went by myself. Um, <laughs> bad. Sorry. I don't know if my family even knew I went by myself to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> but uh, confession's good for the soul. Um, and I'm in line, and, and Chick-fil-A usually does a fantastic job with customer service. It's one of the reasons why I like it, that and the Chick-fil-A sauce. And... Um, like there's one person at the counter and all these other people now in their defense, the drive through line was taking a long time. Um, not taking a long time, it was very busy. So they were probably doing a lot of drive through orders, but I'm standing there and I'm waiting. And I'm waiting for that famous, like, how can I serve you? And it's like, thank you, and it's my pleasure. Like the, the whole experience is great, usually. But it just was just a wait. Kept waiting, kept standing there. I'm like, do you see me? <laughs> I'm here. I'm hungry. I want you to give me my your business. Like, I come on. Didn't say anything, but all that is happening internally. And then I think at a certain point, I even tried to like, like get taller. <laughs> Maybe I'm short. Maybe I can't see me. Like, what is going on here? And then finally, it was. How can I help you? Okay, here we go. And the food actually came pretty quickly, which was good. But I began to, to think a little bit about that as a microcosm of things I've experienced in my life where I'm, I'm waiting for something and I'm in line and I'm wondering, do you see me? And sometimes I even direct that question toward God. Hey, God. And this just shows I don't really understand my, my birthright as an as a adopted son, okay? Hey, God, I, I don't know if you've been keeping track, but I've been a pastor for several years. And um, I got a biblical studies degree, and I got a Master of Divinity, and you know, I, 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 I seek to, to do my best to walk with you and point other people to you. And do you see me? I'm not asking for much, God. I'm just asking for this one thing. Are you there? Do you care? Waiting is not easy. Unless... You listen really closely to what the Bible says about waiting. Isaiah 40, beginning with verse 28, says this. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. 
They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Whether I'm sitting or standing tallly in a Chick-fil-A line, or whether I'm wondering, God, are you going to keep me together? Are you going to keep this place together? Are you going to keep this world together? God says, hey, you're weary, you're tired, you're faint. I'm not. I am the everlasting God. I do not grow weary. I do not faint. And when you're waiting, let's just get really specific here. Some of you are waiting for a wayward child to come back to faith in Jesus. Some of you are waiting to see your marriage restored. Some of you are waiting for a job opportunity. Some of you are waiting to get out of financial hardship. Some of you are wondering, hey, I think I want to be married and I can't find a spouse. What's going on here? Some of you are waiting because you're struggling with physical sickness or mental illness. And you're wondering, where are you, God? He doesn't grow weary. He does not faint. And while you are waiting, put your hope in the one who never fails. You will renew your strength when you put your hope in him and you wait for him to come through. And you'll mount up with wings as eagles. You'll run and not grow weary and you'll walk and not faint. He will sustain you through it all. He's got you. Because at just the right time, at the perfect time, God sent forth his son. And guys, for us, that God sending forth his son happened 2,000 years ago. That reality and truth has already happened. And it said it was God's son, which means he's 100% God. And then Paul says, born of a woman, which means he's 100% man. And then he says, born under the law, which means he was 100% obedient. Because he's all God, he's all man, and he's perfectly obedient. He has the resources to redeem you from the penalty and curse of the law. So you're in bondage, you're in slavery, you're in prison. And Jesus, the one who breaks people out of prison, is going and looking and he's pointing and saying, I redeem her, I redeem him, I redeem him, I redeem her, over and over and over, and delivering us out of that bondage. So if you're waiting to be delivered, if it feels like a long wait, if it feels like prison and bondage, wait on the Lord. To renew your strength and at just the right time when the fullness of time comes he's there and he's got you not only did he send his son but he says I don't just want to redeem you I don't just want to free you I want to actually invite you into my home. I want to invite you to be one of my children. One of our favorite ministry partners is Restore Network. And they're taking foster kids and, and, and families are feeling called by God to take care of these kids when they're struggling. And sometimes that leads to reconciliation with their actual families, which is always goal number one. And then goal number two, if that doesn't happen, many of these families say, I will adopt this child. You know, under Roman law, it's pretty wild. You could actually legally disown your biological child. But if you went to the court of law and said, I want to adopt so-and-so, there was something you signed that said, okay, but if you're actually going to do this and you're going to pay the money to adopt and it's going to become a legal document, you are bound by law. You can never disown your adopted child. Never. That sounds a lot like what Jesus says. Whenever Jesus says, all who the Father will give to me will come to me and no one can ever pluck them out of my hand. Me and the Father are one. If you are his, 
He's got you. No one can pluck you out of his hand. So it's redemption. You're redeemed. You're bought back. And now you're invited into the family. But it has been uh, said by, by people that are working with kids that have experienced untold um, trauma and abuse that you can give a kid who's experienced a lot of bad stuff everything that they need and they're always waiting for like the next foot to fall down. They're always like, okay, but why are you feeding me? When are you gonna take my bedroom away? When are you gonna take my bed away? And they hoard food and they don't trust and they act out and they struggle because they don't know how good and generous and rich as the heart of the heavenly father. And that's all of us to an extent it's highlighted much more when it comes to kids who have experienced incredible abuse and trauma. But guys, Paul's saying, don't be far too easily pleased here, guys. You have a seat at the family table as an equal, as one who is invited to this table. But guys, I, you, you aren't going to be able to get this. Um, if you just understand that the son came and lived and died and rose again to declare you righteous. I was like, wait, Stephen, are you telling me that Jesus is not all sufficient in and of himself? And no, that's not what I'm saying, but I am saying this. The Bible says that God doesn't just send his son. Look at verse five, is it five? Verse six and because you are sons, this is your reality, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. God knows that you and I need an experience with the creator. And it's been said so often by so many of us that so many people miss heaven by about eight inches, which is the amount of space between your head and your heart that they actually are able to get A's on Bible trivia games, but they don't experience the reality of what it means to be an adopted son or daughter of God. Well, God doesn't want us to miss this, okay? And if, if you have kids yourself, like there are things you don't want your kids to miss, there are experiences, the very best experiences that we've had growing up. And it's not like that we want to necessarily recreate that, but we are hopeful that our kids have at least as good, if not better, than the experiences we've had. And here's your heavenly father saying, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit of my perfect son, and I'm going to put it into the heart of every single one of my adopted children. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to cry out, Abba, Father. They're going to have a connection with me that is the exact same connection that my son Jesus had with me. I'm going to put my spirit inside of them. What does uh, this adoption mean? I think it, it means a lot of, of things, but I, I went on a, on a long bicycle ride Friday, and, and that was my big question, was what, what does adoption, what does adoption into the family of God, what does that really mean? And I came up with an ABC, which meant I had a lot of time, because I normally don't do ABCs and alliteration, but... It means you have assurance, guys. And you know what? The Christian faith is the only faith where we actually have assurance. Only in Jesus coming down from heaven to earth do, do we have grace and mercy and forgiveness 
every other religious system in the world is us trying to climb our way to God. Only in Christianity does God come down to rescue us from the pit. And in that assurance, he wants you to know who your father is. So I'm gonna put my spirit, the spirit of my son in your heart so that you will know that you know that you know that you know. Okay, and this has been common just in normal vernacular language. It's like people, this is like, hey, if you know, you know. Okay, and we say that if you know, you know about a lot of things now. It's like for the Christian, that experience, if you know, you know. And there's two things. One, if you know, the Holy Spirit inside of you will testify with your spirit that you are a child of God. And if you go, I, I actually don't know if I know, then wonderful. Get really curious about that and begin to ask God, hey, God, I want to know. I want to know that I know that I know I need you. I need your help. I need your guidance. I need your forgiveness. Would you please send the spirit of your son into my heart? Because I want to cry out, Abba, Father. So he goes on in the last verse here. I say, so you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So two closing things, and then we're going to take communion. Um, just so we all know that this is not a 2024 Alton, Illinois problem. Um, I, I want to revisit probably the most famous short story in the entire Bible. It's the parable of the prodigal son. Y'all remember what the prodigal did? He said, hey, dad, give me my share of the inheritance. Then he left, went to far countries, spent all the money, ended up in a pig pen, and it says he came to himself. He came to himself. Some people translate that he got back to his right mind. And you know what he immediately thought of when he got back to his right mind? He thought of his father. Guys, we all have run away. And the only way that you and I can get back to our right mind is when we think of our heavenly father. And he thought about his father's home. And he thought about his father's love. But get this, he's, I'm not worthy to be his son again. So I'll go back and I will ask him to make me one of his hired servants. So I'd rather be a hired servant in the house of my father than live away from my father. And he gets up and he makes the journey back home. When he's still a long way off, his father sees him. And his father runs to him. Guys, that is part of the father sending the spirit of his son into your heart. He is running to his wayward son. Not only is he running to his wayward son, but he embraces him. He kisses him. He gives him the robe and the ring. The robe was his father's reign. The ring was the family reign. And before his speech is over, the father says, no, kill the fattened calf. This son of mine, not servant, not slave, not depressed wretch. This son of mine was lost and now he's found. He was dead. And now he's alive again. Guys, um, I need the spirit of the son in my heart to cry out, Abba, Father. And you need, this is not a, oh, this is a good extra. This would be a good cherry on top. This is not cherry on top. This is steak and potatoes. This is the basic bare essentials. This is your breath. You need the spirit 
of the Savior, Jesus, in your heart. And by him, you cry out, Daddy, Daddy, do you see me? Are you here? Are you with me? And whether your weight is in a Chick-fil-A line or your weight is with some illness or some broken relationship or some dream that's been destroyed at just the right time. The Father will send the spirit of his son into your heart and tell you, you're mine and I've got you and I've got you forever here and eternity. I've got you. So there's a lot of ways to respond to this message, but it hit me that a lot of times, even when I call for response, either for myself or for other people, it's all so cognitive. It's all so in my head. But deep, deep truth is so much more than just facts in your head. It's experiential in your heart, soul, deep down in your bones. So we have communion that we're going to have opportunity to partake of. But I want this moment to be a moment when you and I will be given faith. Oh yeah, I just said an A for assurance. Guys, the the B is boldness. Okay, when I know that the Father's my daddy, I can come. I can come boldly. And if I know that my Father in heaven is rich and generous and powerful and mighty and never lets me go, I know I'm gonna get what I need from him. I know I am. And then that C is clarity, guys. It gives me clarity to know what I need to be about in my life and what I need to just like walk away from. Your adoption as a child of God, he wants you to experience assurance, boldness, and clarity. So as you come to the table, there's an opportunity and an invitation, not just to take a little piece of bread and dip it in a cup, but for you to actually experience the spirit of Jesus invading your heart. And uh, one other thing we're gonna do, we're gonna have people that come and serve like we usually do. But I asked um, Matt Phelps, and then I'll be on the other side. Uh, there's gonna be two of us that are just gonna be available after you take communion uh, for prayer. And if you want someone to pray with you about whatever it is, then you have opportunity to do that. You don't have to pray with Matt or I. We're just two people that are saying, we're willing. You may right now hear God say, go up and be available for your brothers and sisters to pray with you also. Great, good. And you may say, I need either for the first time or I need a fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit touching my heart and reminding me who I am. And we just wanna pray, all of us, like we all need this, guys. This is his table. This is his invitation for every single one of us today to cry out, Abba, Father, let's pray. Father, give us grace today to know that we are, through faith in your son, adopted into your family. And God, may we experience the spirit of your son coming into our hearts. And may we genuinely and truthfully be able to cry out today, Abba, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. So as we prepare for communion, this table is for anyone and everyone who cries out to Jesus and says, Jesus, save me, help me, heal me. 
And uh, what I've discovered about that prayer is it's an ongoing thing. We need to be reminded of that every single day. But the table today is more than just taking the bread and taking the cup. It's, It's asking God, God, I need your spirit to invade my heart with who you are. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. He took the cup and poured it out and said, this is my blood for the forgiveness of your sins, the way that you're redeemed. And as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. But Jesus also did something for the disciples in an upper room when it was locked. It says he breathed on them. And when he breathed on them, they received the Holy Spirit. They were clothed with power from on high to live like who they really are, the adopted sons and daughters of God. So if this is your testimony, that Jesus has saved me, I'm an adopted child of God, then this communion is for you. But I would ask that you taste and see today. The Lord is good and you'll find refuge and him, and him alone.
just the right time, just the right time. And uh, some of you, I know some things that you're facing even this week. And uh, it's my prayer that you would know at just the right time, when the fullness of time comes, God's going to send the spirit of his son into your heart. And no matter what fear, illness, sickness, disease, brokenness, pain. God's got you. And he's going to let you know he's there with you forever and always. We've got one more song. I think it's uh, Remind Me, Nick, what's the song? All Hail. And uh, he's the one 
who defeated death in our place. I'm going to invite you to stand and just uh, for what it's worth, I didn't go into this, that word cry out, Abba, Father, is not a Abba. It's a lot louder than that. It's a lot more bold than that. It's a lot more confident than a little whisper. So I'm just going to say that, and however the Holy Spirit leads you to sing this final song, go with whatever it is he leads you to do. There was a moment when the lights went out, when death claimed its victory. King of love had given up his life. The darkest day in history. There on the cross they made for sinners. For every curse his blood atoned. One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice was made as the heavens roar All hail King Jesus All hail the Lord of heaven and earth All hail King Jesus Let us join with all of heaven's 
singing the end of it all, it's all about him. It's all about his glory for our good. Um, so this week, remember who you are and remember whose you are. Let's receive this benediction. God, thank you. Thank you for sending the spirit of your son into our hearts by which we can cry out, Abba, Father. May we live this week with assurance, boldness, and clarity to walk with you, to worship you. Thank you for your love that never ends. And thank you that you not only love us, but you also like us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you.